It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I apologize it's not Paul Miller, but it's me. Uh, <laughs> but my question is to the Premier. <laughs> my question is to the Premier. Earlier this week, the Premier was on Facebook urging Ontarians to get their flu shots. The Ministry of Health says it's safer and easier than ever. If that's the case, why are we hearing from constituent after constituent about the challenges of accessing a flu shot for seniors in our province? Here. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, I, I thank the member very much for the question, but in actual fact, we do have an adequate supply of flu vaccines here in Ontario. They were ordered in advance. We paid uh, $54 million for the flu shots that is more than adequate to get over 30 per cent of the population uh, to achieve the vaccine, which is what it's been in the past. We hope it's going to be more this year because it is so important, and flu is a much more a deadly disease for many people than one may think. But in actual fact, you can go to your physician's office, you can go to a public health unit, you can go to um, a, a pharmacy to get your flu shot. We have not been advised in the ministry that there have been any significant concerns with accessing the vaccine. There may be from one location to another, but there are many locations where one can go to receive the vaccine, and I would encourage people to continue looking, calling around to make, sure, to make sure that that actual location has the vaccine in quantities that are necessary. Supplementary. The Ministry of Health says seniors are particularly at risk of serious complications due to the flu, but seniors tell us that they're struggling to find high-dose vaccines that are recommended specifically for the seniors. We couldn't find them either. Uh, of the 20 clinics that we called around the province, 12 said they haven't been able to obtain any vaccines or they were already out. Um, and so uh, we're really concerned about that. And a few of them uh, did have vaccines, but warned us that they would be running out of that supply very soon. Um, so, Minister, are we ready for flu season or not? Minister. We are absolutely ready for flu season. That is why we have made the vaccine available. That is why we have boosted locations in hospitals across the province to make sure that we can handle the extra volumes. But in terms of the actual high-dose flu vaccine for seniors 65 years and older, it's not for every person, but many seniors um, should get that one. It's not available in pharmacies. It's only available at doctor's offices. So there may be a little bit of confusion about that. If they are looking, they should probably call their doctor's office to make sure that they can get the high-dose flu vaccine there. Final supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps we can make that information more readily accessible and available to seniors so that there is no confusion on where they should be accessing their shot. A flu shot is the best defense when it comes to reducing the risk of getting and spreading the flu. The minister has been quite rightly urging people to get their flu shots. But when they go to get them, as we were mentioning, some seniors are actually being turned away. Is, if there's a shortage, why has the minister not informed the public? Minister. Well, I, I stress to say there is no shortage. We have an adequate volume of flu vaccines for anyone who wishes to obtain one in Ontario. If there are seniors who are having difficulty accessing the high-dose flu vaccine, they are welcome to call my office, and we will connect them with a physician who is able to provide them with it, because it should not be that anyone who wants the vaccine can't get it. We want everyone in Ontario to get the flu vaccine. It's simple to do, and it's free, and everyone should avail themselves of it. Thank you. Next question, the member for Timiskaming. My question is to the Premier. A shortage of flu vaccine highlights just how important our health system is to people who rely on it. Since the election, the Minister of Health has told hospitals to tighten their belts and is promising more so-called efficiencies. Does the minister think cuts in privatization will improve our health care system? Minister of Health. Minister? Well, I think the flu vaccine should be something that is basic for everybody in Ontario, and I cannot understand why uh, there's a big controversy.
controversy on the other side about that. It is simple to obtain. It's free. It is your best defense against the flu. You can get it anywhere. You can get it at your doctor's office, at a public health unit, at a pharmacy. We need to encourage more people to get the flu vaccine, and we have more than an adequate supply for this season. Here, here. Stop the clock. Supplementary. For people who want reliable public health services when they need them, the signs are not encouraging, Speaker. The government has assembled the same experts who helped close 28 hospitals and fire 6,000 nurses. And local hospitals from the West Lincoln Memorial in Grimsby to the Ross Memorial in Lindsay are already being targeted for merger. The minister has called for efficiencies. Are these the kind that she has in mind? Minister. It's a bit of a stretch from the flu vaccine to go to hospitals, but okay, I'll give it a try. Um, what we are trying to do is to make sure that people receive excellent quality health care throughout this province. We are working with hospitals across the province to find out what they need in order to stay up to date with their capital projects. We are looking for internal efficiencies, of course, in the way that we do things, not in terms of lowering health care available to people. What we want to do is increase the level of health care services that are available in Ontario because we know we have a rapidly aging population. We have medications that are coming on stream that are extremely expensive. There are more and more pressures being placed in our system, but we are coping with them internally because we want to make sure that people in Ontario continue Response. to have excellent quality health care now and into the future. Start the clock. Final supplementary. People want a health system that's there when they need it, whether they need a flu shot or a hospital bed. While hospitals across Ontario continue to operate above capacity, patients wait for care in hallways, and seniors can't even seem to get the flu shot, the government is promoting where and when they need it. It's clear that our system can't afford another round of reckless conservative cuts. Will the Premier reject that agenda? Minister. Well, one of the reasons why we have so many strains in our health care system right now is because we've been left with a $15 billion yeah. debt. in excellent hands, and that is what we are going to do, and we are going to make sure that our public is protected against the flu shot and other health issues that are, they're going to be faced with, and that is what we are doing, and that is what we concentrate on each and every day, and we are working with our health care partners to make sure that not only will we have a health care system now, but we will actually have a health care system for the yeah. future. Yeah. It's not sustainable the way we're going now. We are going to make it sustainable. To remind members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier regarding the government's policy on ethics and integrity of their ministers. Order on the government side. There was a disturbing media report yesterday, Mr. Speaker, revealing that the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services and his law firm have been embroiled in multiple legal Order proceedings on the government side. that include serious allegations of misconduct and fraud over a period of almost two decades. Was the Premier aware of this history when he appointed this minister and put him in charge of overseeing Ontario's police services? Through you, Mr. Speaker, that's nothing but a smear campaign. That's all it is. Absolute all smear campaign. The Minister of Community and Safety Services is the most credible minister down here. As he has integrity, he has transparency, and he's an absolute champion. And I'll stand beside him any day, any day, 365 days a year. 
supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the people of Ontario have a right to know. The minister in charge of overseeing Ontario's police services must be above reproach. But yesterday, or actually two days ago now, we learned of multiple allegations made against the minister over several years, including, including a finding by the Ontario Securities Commission that the minister had known on the government for at least three years that his business associates were illegally selling shares in Saxton Securities, a company at the centre of a massive stock fraud. This minister has already come under serious scrutiny when, as minister responsible for the OPP, he campaigned for a candidate at the centre of an OPP investigation. Does the Premier still have confidence in this minister? Through you, Mr. Speaker, I have a thousand percent confidence in a credible man that has sacrificed his time down here to serve his community, to give back to his community. He has integrity, he has honesty, and to put up a smear campaign like that, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed. Once again, once again, I'll remind. Stop the clock. Order. Stop. Order. 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 House will come to order. Once again, I'll remind all members: make your comments through the chair. We start the clock. Member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you. Thank you, My question is for the Minister of Finance. Just over four months ago, our government, for the people, was sworn in. Back in June, people from all walks of life packed the front lawns of Queens Park to meet the Premier and hear him speak. After an exciting campaign, the people of Ontario were eager to hear about our plan for the people. Since that day, we have begun putting more money into taxpayers' pockets. We have sent the message that Ontario is open for business, and we have taken action to restore accountability and trust in our province's finances. Could the minister please inform the House of our government's next upcoming milestone? Which minister? Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre. It has been a long uh, and exciting road since the day we were all sworn in. Our government has taken swift and decisive action to reverse 15 long years of damaging Liberal policies in our province. Although there is much, much more work to be done, the people of Ontario can rest easy that their government is finally working for them. We are excited to continue our work for the people with our government's first fiscal update, the Fall Economic Statement. Speaker, we intend to table the Fall Economic Statement on Thursday, November 15th, when we will share more of our plan to help families and make Ontario open for business. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. I am very excited to hear that our government's fall economic statement is coming on November 15th. If our accomplishments to date are any indication, I know that this fiscal update will send a clear message right across Ontario. People now have a government that respects their tax dollars and takes the fiscal challenges ahead seriously. We've learned over the past few months just how damaging and devastating 15 years of Liberal government have been for our province. It is a relief to hear that help is here, and not a moment too soon. 
Could, could the minister please inform the House about what we can expect from the fall economic statement? Good question. Good question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. The fall economic statement will turn the page on 15 long years of tax and spend yeah. liberal yeah. policies. Yeah. Speaker, the days of attempting to balance budgets through one-time revenue are over. Yeah. Hidden deficits are a thing of the past. As our first fiscal update, it will lay the groundwork for the continued relief we are bringing to families and businesses across Ontario. Every decision that we make is for the people, and the fall economic statement will be no different. We understand the responsibility the people have given us, and we intend to get our province back on track. Speaker, we are prepared to clean up the mess the Liberals left behind. On November 15th, Ontario will know that help is on the way. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Um, my question is about the Premier's Select Committee on Financial Transparency. There are no witnesses appearing this week, uh, yet when the New Dem Democrats propose hearing from Hydro One's uh, $9 million man, the former CEO, Mayo Schmidt, the Conservative MPPs blocked it. Whoa. Whoa. So if the point of this committee is to let the sunshine of transparency in, why are government members trying to close the curtains? Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. You know, we began uh, with an inquiry, uh, a an inquiry a commission that showed us, Speaker, that there is a $15 billion deficit. We followed that up with the line-by-line -line review, which has revealed a tremendous amount about the state of the Liberal finances. Speaker, we know that all this has led, Speaker, to the uh, Select Committee. This Select Committee's job is to get to the bottom. What happened? How did this happen? And how can we ever stop this tragedy from happening again? Speaker, not only did the Liberals tell us they had a balanced budget in 2017 when it is now proven by the Spons. committee that it was a $3.7 billion deficit? They left this, the people of Ontario, with a $15 billion hole to dig out of. Supplementary. So to hear the, the minister tell it, and I'm back to the Premier, the Standing Committee on fin Fiscal Transparency is a serious exercise in fiscal accountability. But that's not what it looked like this week. After insisting that commercially sensitive documents obtained from the IESO be made publicly available on Monday, government members on the committee decided to make them secret again on Tuesday. Oh. And then they blocked witnesses who could shed some light on the issues that were supposed to be investigating. New Democrats want to hear from witnesses who could shed light on what's happening at Hydro One and what has happened. Why are Conservatives blocking an appearance from Mayo Schmidt? Minister. Speaker, what we are witnessing is without precedent in recent Canadian history. It is more than just the number, Speaker. It is about the abuse of the public trust by the Liberals, backed up by the NDP. Yes. Their accountability did not end, Order. Speaker, on Election Day. Accountability in Ontario began on Election Day. We now have a, a far better understanding of the breadth and depth the waste, the management at the highest levels of the previous Liberal government. And, Speaker, the NDP can continue to deal in chaos. We will deal in confidence. The NDP will deal in resistance. We will deliver results. Yes, yes. Opposition, come to order. Start the clock. Next question, 
The member for Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. As my father was in the Navy, and I'm a member of Legion 147 and an honorary member of Simcoe and Gray Foresters. I'm proud, proud to see the poppy being worn by so many in the House. It's a clear sign Remembrance Day is fast approaching. Remembrance Day, formerly known as Armistice Day, was born out of the armistice signed at the end of the First World War. Remembrance Day is especially important as it marks 100 years from the signing of that armistice and the end of, end of the First World War. With that being said, can the minister explain why it's so important for Ontarians to take a pause on Remembrance Day and remember the sacrifices by the brave men and women of the Canadian Forces? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Barrie, Springwater, Oro Madante for that very thoughtful and, of course, uh, very important question this morning. As the proud member for Bay of Quinte, which is home to Canada's largest Air Force base at CFP Trenton, I'm very pleased to have military members living in my community that I call friends. Uh, from the world wars through to modern-day conflicts, including the war in Afghanistan, and keep in mind that as our brave men and women of the Canadian Forces were being returned home home after paying the ultimate price in Afghanistan, they were repatriated at CFB Trenton. The courageous people within the Canadian Armed Forces have kept us safe and far removed from war in our daily lives. Whether it be in the Canadian Army, the Royal Canadian Air Force, or the Royal Canadian Navy, these incredible troops have kept our country strong and free. That's why, as Ontarians, on November 11th, we take time to pay a moment of silence at cenotaphs and assembly halls across Ontario. It's a small gesture, Speaker, that Response. goes along way and brings us together as Canadians and Ontarians to show our shared gratitude for their service. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the Minister for that response. It's my hope that Ontarians across the province will attend a Remembrance Day ceremony this year, whether it's here in, their, in Queen's Park or at home in their ridings. This government understands the importance of not only remembering, but also commemorating the bravery and courage of our Canadian Armed Forces. That is why, during the campaign, our Premier and our party promised to build the war memorial to the veterans of the war in Afghanistan who fought to promote and protect our democracy. Can the minister please tell this House, our government, what we'll be doing to inform Ontarians of Remembrance Day and how they can honour the sacrifices of our military in their own riding? Great question. Minister. Thanks again uh, to the member for the question. Our government is launching a comprehensive campaign. We have actually already done that, Mr. Speaker, uh, to inform people about Remembrance Day and ensure as many Ontarians as possible get out to honour our veterans. As the member alluded to before, our government will be paying tribute to all veterans of the war in Afghanistan by building a memorial in their honour on the grounds here at Queen's Park. And beginning on November 5th, next week, Remembrance Week will be an opportunity for Ontarians to unite and pay tribute to members of the Canadian Armed Forces for their courage and sacrifice in serving Canada at home and abroad. During this time, Ontarians can participate by organizing a Remembrance Day, a Remembrance Week event, and share their gratitude and respect online by using the hashtag Remembrance Day. Residents can also visit the interactive map at Ontario.ca slash Remembrance Day speaker to easily find a Remembrance Day ceremony that's near them in their community. And I encourage all members of the House and everybody watching to find your your own way to honour our veterans a week from Sunday, November 11. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Attorney General. This summer, the government called emergency sessions to ramp through unilateral cuts to Toronto City Council, yet this government chose not to spend any time preparing for the legalization of cannabis, something we had all known was coming for years. Now, media report after media report shows that the government has botched the rollout of cannabis legalization. With over 1,000 complaints to the Ombudsman about the Ontario Cannabis Store in just two weeks, why is this government so wholly unprepared to handle the rollout of legal cannabis? The Attorney General. The Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Finance. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. Thank you for the question. Uh, it is our understanding that the Ontario Cannabis Store is indeed working with the Ombudsman on this matter. You know, Speaker, customers have a right to great customer service, and we expect the Ontario Cannabis Store to deliver. But I will say uh, that Ontario received more orders from cannabis online, 100,000 orders on the first day. That is more than every single other uh, province combined. So it, it is a lot of holy smokes. Uh, we continue to work very closely with all stakeholders. These are unchartered waters. We've been in prohibition for 100 years. We've rolled out a multi-million dollar business in a multi-billion dollar sector. And uh, we know that uh, the Ontario Cannabis Spons. Supply will continue to provide good service to our customers. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, um, you know other provinces are not having the backlog in delivery that our provinces and the media are reporting that the Ontario Cannabis Store customers Inside, are so frustrated by the current system that they are actually going back to the illicit market and black market in order to access legal cannabis. Speaker, every time the Ontario Cannabis Store botches or delays an order, they are encouraging that customer to return to the black market. Minister, why is why what and what is this government doing? to curtail the black market of cannabis, and why are we not prepared to offer a legal alternative? Minister. Thank you very much. Well, certainly we are prepared to offer a legal alternative. Uh, the uh, OCS.ca, the Ontario Cannabis Store, is uh, open for business and making deliveries on a daily basis uh, despite the uh, postal disruptions, uh, Speaker. But look, when it comes to these uh, illegal dispensaries, let us be absolutely and crystal clear with this. If you are operating an illegal dispensary today, we'll you will never ever, ever have the opportunity now to uh, own a legal brick and mortar store. We're crystal clear on that. And you asked about the tools. We have given municipalities the tools to uh, act. It is a two, up to a $250,000 fine, not only on the illegal dispensary for, for continuing to offer cannabis illegally, but it is also up to a $250,000 fine for the landlord. And this is one way that we are moving, Speaker, to curb this. If the, if the building is owned by a corporation, it is up to Response. a million-dollar fine. Ooh, so the tools are being made to municipalities to thwart this. The whole goal is to curb the ill. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Uh, I hope you had a fun Halloween. Speaker, yesterday was a really scary day for Ontarians and not because of all the little ghosts and goblins that came to the door, but because Ontario became the largest jurisdiction in North America without a plan for climate change. We're likely the largest place in the world. Climate change presents a danger right now to our way of life. And I know the Premier is busy with his federal leadership campaign. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it's sheer madness, sheer madness that we have no plan for climate change here in Ontario. So, through you, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell us if he has a plan for climate change and if he does, what it is? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, our government was elected to get rid of the inefficient cap and trade, a tax grab, a tax grab that this, this province and this country has never seen. It's about, making, it's about making businesses more competitive, about taking the burden off the backs of each in individual in Ontario. It's about making Ontario thrive once again. And as the Financial Accountability Officer said, confirming that we're going to save the taxpayers $1.3 billion, that's $264 a household, until they might be able to go out and do the things they may not be able to do under the cap and trade, that, the carbon tax. It's an absolute Fox. worst tax ever. ever. Supplementary. Well, um, I have your answer for you, uh, Mr. Premier. 
Um, you do have a plan for climate change, and as a matter of fact, your Minister of the Environment signed on to it about this time last year, and I think the Attorney General did, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Actually, the whole front row signed on to the People's Guarantee that had a plan for climate change. Well, you did, probably most of your caucus. You did. You did. Oh, there's one that didn't. There we go. We do have the anomaly. So the question is this. What's changed in the last 12 months? What's the big change? So the C.D. Howe Institute tells us we need a plan. Two of this year's Nobel Prize winners, they told us we need a plan. Speaker, you're, the Premier's own budget advisor has been telling people we need a plan. So how is it that the Premier can find the time to find jobs for his friends but can't find time to have a plan for climate change? Premier. Minister of Environment. To the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, let me, I'll tell the, uh, the leader of the Independent Liberals what happened and what changed. What changed was an election, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we've been clear. We, we, we will bring forward a plan this month, a plan this month that does not punish Ontario taxpayers, that does not punish Ontario families. What we won't have is the sort of out of control spending that was a part of the cap and trade program. Money going to you know, Warren Buffett to help him build an electric truck factory. You know, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on Windows programs that were out of control. Mr. Speaker, our program won't punish Ontario families. It rewards Ontario families. It rewards Ontario for the work it's already done on climate change. Response. We'll help reduce greenhouse gases. We'll plan for the future, but we won't punish Ontario families. Order. Next question. Start the clock. The member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. I want to make sure my colleagues are ready for this. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The nearly 10 million drivers across Ontario have sent us a strong message. They want an auto insurance system that meets their needs and works for them. We have heard a lot of ideas over the past weeks about the need to improve our auto insurance system. Some of, the, some of these ideas, however, have been better than others. I'm concerned that the member from Brampton East has brought forward a plan that would exacerbate existing insurance within the system, Speaker. As the, as the private member's bill introduced by the member from Brampton East will be debated this afternoon, could the minister please inform the House about the shortcomings of the proposed legislation? Mr. Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, for the question. The NDEP member from Brampton East has introduced a bill that would cause auto insurance rates to increase across the GTA. The member proposes that the GTA be considered a single geographic area when insurance companies set their rates. However, his failed attempt to address rate discrimination would only serve to spread the issue to more communities. In fact, his plan would cause rate, rates to rise in NDP ridings such as Toronto Danforth, Beaches East York, Toronto St. Paul's, Parkdale High Park and University Rosedale. Speaker, I wonder if these members will be supporting their colleagues' bills and voting for higher auto insurance rates for their own constituents. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's unfortunate that the member from Brampton East is promoting a policy that would only serve to increase insurance costs across the GTA. After the failed stretch goals of the Liberals and the NDP drivers across Ontario demand better, Speaker, and they deserve better. Thankfully, we have another option available to us. As we all know, get ready, Paul. <laughs> My caucus colleague, the member from Milton, has this. <laughs> has introduced a private member's bill ending discrimination in Automobile Insurance Act 2018 Question. that, if passed, 
will actually make a positive difference, Speaker. Could the minister please remind the House about the thoughtful proposals of the member from Milton brought forward to the legislature? Minister, stop the clock. Start the clock. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Speaker. Well, I'll begin by once again thanking the member from Milton for his leadership on this file. Unfortunately, Speaker, the NDP member from Brampton East rushed to introduce his bill after the PC member from Milton introduced his thoughtful proposal. The member from Brampton East, again, was a few days late and many, many dollars short. However, the member from Milton, Speaker, got this right. He took the time to consult, to listen, to develop a plan that, if passed, would deliver real fairness to the system. His bill proposes fundamental changes to the auto insurance system. We truly look forward to further discussing his bill when it comes to debate. Together, we will ensure fairness in rate setting and discriminatory Response. practices and work towards a system that puts drivers first. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Good morning, Minister. Speaker, I know you've heard of the organization Big Brothers and Big Sisters. While the government helps fund them to provide a mentoring program in the schools, it's cost efficient and provides essential prevention and intervention to children already demonstrating negative behaviors towards teachers and their peers. Speaker, some of these kids are already engaging in risky behavior such as drug or alcohol abuse, or they face mental health challenges. Can the minister tell us why she is considering ending the funding to such a valuable mentoring program? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, I'm Mr. Sure Speaker. I'm pleased to stand and address this because we need to be sure that, first and foremost, big brothers and big sisters, they're supported by amazing corporations and communities throughout this province. And I tip my hat to those communities and those corporations like Westcast. There's a bolathon going to be coming up shortly, and I applaud everyone that reaches out and support big brothers and big sisters from one end of this province to another. But I need to be crystal clear on this, Speaker, when it comes to transfer payments. We are absolutely taking our time and making sure that after a $15 billion deficit, that we get it right in education. We're working through a line-by-line -line audit to make sure that the programs that we support align with our education priorities. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Speaker, cutting this mentoring program will cause a great deal of damage. It could well end up costing society much more in the long run, let alone breaking the mentoring bond. Sometimes these are the only reliable, consistent influences in a troubled life. Speaker, thousands of troubled young people need this service, including more than 500 in my area alone. Will the minister do the right thing? and protect this valuable service offered through big brothers and big sisters. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to do the right thing by clarifying and making sure every member in the opposition party knows we are reviewing all of Absolutely. our transfer payment programs. Thing to do. We have hit pause Order. so we can do a line-by-line -line audit and do the responsible thing. You know, it's actually embarrassing for this opposition party to be fear-mongering like they are Order. because they're saying things that are absolutely wrong. And so our number one priority, as I said before, Response is making sure that our transfer payments align with our priority ensuring a safe, supportive, meaningful learning environment for our students across this province. So, Speaker, again, we are working very diligently to make sure, as we Thoughts. conduct our line-by-line -line audit, that we have programs that align with our education priorities. Here, Thank here. you very much. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Sorry, 
Start the clock. Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Honourable Minister responsible for citizenship and immigration. It's moving day in Ontario again. Anywhere between 450 to 600 illegal border crossers are looking for accommodations now that the federal government's October 31st deadline to cover their hotel bills has come and gone. Since crossing illegally into Canada, they went from sleeping in temporary holding facilities to college dorms to hotel rooms and now potentially to Ontario's homeless shelters. The illegal border crosses crossers crisis is out of control. Could the minister update the House on what the federal government is doing or isn't doing to address this crisis? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. A standing Services. question by the member uh, opposite I, uh, from our own uh, caucus, uh, who's been a strong advocate for immigration and refugees in the province of Ontario. So thank you very much for that look. Today, the federal minister of immigration, um, who has some responsibility for immigration, but they have played musical ministers there, gave a speech at the Canadian Club, but he failed to address the illegal border crossing issue that has uh, strained our budget here in the province of Ontario up to the tune of $200 million. Dollars. Wow. The lack of respect for Ontarians by the federal government is unacceptable, and I will continue to challenge the Trudeau Liberals. It's important to note that all premiers of all political parties right across this country stand shoulder to shoulder with Ontario and our Premier Minister Fo Pre Premier Ford to have to, to call on the federal Liberals for leadership on this file. This is an issue that's not even just suggested by uh, the government's own internal um, polling. It's also by the own, their own Liberal cabinet um, and their own little go government, where John McKay says the only fair thing for everybody is to process. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Canadians are losing confidence in the federal government's ability to manage the crisis of irregular border crossers. We expect, no, we demand better from the federal government, and we in this House certainly expect the federal government to pay their bills. Could the minister update the House on what our government for the people is doing in response to the crisis created by the federal government? It's very much the member opposite. Of course, we have spoken very loudly and clearly with the other provinces that this is a crisis. It is a strain on our budget, up to the tune of $200 million and growing in the province of Ontario. I've had numerous discussions with numerous federal ministers, but nobody wants to take responsibility on the federal level for this initiative. In fact, uh, they play musical ministers. I'm now dealing with, uh, I think, five federal ministers on trying to obtain the $200 million they own the pro owe the province of Ontario. Let's go through those costs. $90 million on social assistance costs, $84 million and growing on uh, accommodation costs, $20 million for education and growing, and over $3 million that we provided to the Red Cross. So I have a message to the NDP and to the Liberals over there. Join us. Call on the federal government to pay its bills. Stop the clock. Order. Next question. Start the clock. Member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, 58 public health nurses servicing the greater Thunder Bay region have been on strike for over three weeks now. After two years without a contract, diminishing resources and dwindling numbers, they're understandably have had enough. But these are health professionals the front lines, and often the first point of contact for thousands of Thunder Bay's most vulnerable residents. What is the Minister of Health doing to bring their employer, the Thunder Bay Health Unit, back to the table and achieve an equitable end to the strike? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, the situation is most unfortunate, and what we are doing now is encouraging all parties to stay at the table and discuss. I know this is causing a lot of concern to people in Thunder Bay, and that uh, it's for the benefit of all patients that the parties get together and try and resolve their differences. We are doing whatever we are able to do, but that is a discussion that needs to happen between the parties. Supplementary. Speaker, our public health nurses are often the first line of defence against infectious disease outbreaks. Just prior to the strike, these nurses were dealing with a serious and potentially deadly tuberculosis outbreak. 
Tuberculosis, unfortunately, isn't so much a disease of the past, but a disease of poverty, which only stands to grow in modern-day Ontario. Not surprisingly, Thunder Bay's Indigenous population has been the hardest hit. The Premier makes great hay of his love and support for frontline health workers. So to the Minister, what is she doing to ensure that these frontline public health nurses have the support of this government to get back to work? Minister. Well, we certainly value the great work that's being done by public health nurses across Ontario. We understand that there are situations where diseases that we once thought were eradicated, like tuberculosis, are now popping up again. It's another reason why we're talking about people getting the flu shot. That's another great public health initiative and announcement. The, very similarly, we heard also with consumption and, uh, and treatment services how valuable they were. Public health made a lot of inroads and, and good prevented us with good evidence based information that we can make decisions on. So once again, all I can expect and hope for is for the parties to come together. We hope that they're able to um, resolve their differences very soon so that they can get back to the really important work that they're doing in our communities. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Yes. Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservancy, Conservation and Parks. For months, we heard that our constituents tell us that life in Ontario is too expensive. Yes. With increasing fuel prices and inflated hydro bills, the people of Ontario have been struggling to make ends meet. Yep. Affordability is a concern that has been expressed by all parties in this legislature. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be part of the government that is attentive yes. and responsive to the concerns of the constituents. Yesterday, our government passed the bill for the Cap and Trade Cancellation Act. Can the minister share with his house how this legislation will provide relief for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Richmond Hill, and, and I, I must commend her on the great work that she does for her, for her constituents. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, our government promised in, in, the, uh, in the recent provincial election to get rid of the regressive job-killing cap-and-trade program. Mr. Speaker, we promised to make life more affordable for Ontarians, and that's exactly what we've done. The bill, as the member mentioned, passed yesterday, the Cap-and-Trade Cancellation Act, and in passing, solidifies that Ontarians will be getting $264 more. Uh, we've already seen gas prices come down by 4.3 cents, and that is a part of an important first step on our way to fulfilling our commitment to reduce gas prices by 10 cents. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax or getting rid of the cap and trade carbon tax will reduce home heating by $80 uh, for a small business. That's $285. Response. Mr. Speaker, as promised, we are going to make life more affordable for Ontarians, and getting rid of cap and trade was just the here, beginning. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, the Minister, for his great answer. This is really, really good news. I can't wait to go back to my constituents' office tomorrow and share with them. I'm sure they will be thrilled to know the savings they'll see with the passing of this legislation. Despite how firm our government has been, in addition to the number of provinces that have been risen in opposition to his carbon pricing plan, Trudeau still threatens this province with his job-killing carbon tax. Okay. The people of Ontario were clear they could not afford the Liberal government's costly, ineffective cap-and-trade carbon tax. They could not afford Trudeau's carbon tax. Can the minister explain to this House what government's plan is to combat the climate plan? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member is quite correct. Uh, when the Prime Minister talks a plan, about a plan, what he's really talking about is a tax. 
Right. It's a tax on moms and dads who need to take their kids to hockey. It's, it's a tax on families that need to compute. My own riding of Ajax, 70 per cent of, of the folks who live there work outside of the, the community. Most of them drive. Many of them have two cars. Um, the costs on them will be, be just too much. When he talks about taxing polluters, Mr. Speaker, he's talking about taxing commuters. Right. Um, so that is why our government has said that we will do everything in our power. And led by, uh, by our Premier, Premier Ford, we are supporting the Saskatchewan government in its, in its uh, court action. We have our own court action going forward. But we will, we will do every tool that we have to stop the gains that have been made by Ontario families from being clawed back by the Prime Minister, yeah. by him taxing families, and by him making life more afford or less affordable for, uh, for Ontarians and worse for Ontario businesses. Yeah. Thank you. The member for Brampton East. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Today we will debate my private member's bill, which will finally put an end to the unfair practice of postal code discrimination in auto insurance rates, which, which penalizes good drivers just because of where they live. During the campaign, the Conservatives promised to end this practice, and now is their opportunity. Will the government support my bill to end this unfair practice once and for all? Minister. Minister Finance. Boy, here it comes. Well, I can't believe we get to do this again, Speaker. <laughs> so, so, somehow, I think we know what we're about to say. Let me first congratulate the member for. <laughs> Member from uh, the member from Brampton East wants us to uh, uh, think th wants the GTA to be consider uh, considered a single geographic area when insurance companies set the rates. But as I said uh, in an earlier uh, answer, this is going to raise NDP members' rates as well as others. But let me just remind you: from Toronto Danforth, your rates will go up. Beaches East York, your rates will go up. Toronto St. Paul's rates are going up. Parkdale High Park. Up, University of Rosedale. Rates are going to rise. This is your own member. If you, this is what you are about to do. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Well, according to dozens of lawyers who examined both my bill and the bill put forward by the member from Milton. Only my bill will actually end the practice of postal code discrimination in auto insurance. In fact, in fact, these lawyers said, and I quote, on the surface they may look the same, but to those of us with experience fighting for drivers, there are important differences that make Bill 44, introduced by Grutten Singh, superior to Bill 42, the member for Nelson's bill. Simply put, Bill 42 has vague language which creates a loophole that insurance companies can exploit, and Bill 44 does not. Mr. Singh's bill will protect safe drivers, while Mr. Gill's bill will let companies Question. continue to exploit drivers just because of where they live. Okay. Minister, why is the government allowing insurance companies to put, continue gouging good drivers because of where they live? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Well, thank you very much. While I can tell the member from Brampton East uh, with a small history lesson, Premier, that it was the Liberal government back in 2012 that was attempting to get their budget passed and asked the NDP for what concessions they could make, and together they conspired to come up with a 15 per cent savings on insurance rates. Sure. Speaker, there was never any plan, there was never any hope of that ever happening, but they got into bed with each other on this deal that was going nowhere, and that's what happened, Speaker. That's why, uh, uh, unlike our party, where we acknowledge, Speaker, that there are 10 million drivers in Ontario who expect us to do everything we can to ensure the auto insurance system is working for them. Speaker, we congratulate the member from Milton for his
start the clock. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, November 1st of every year marks the beginning of Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week in Ontario. Over 65 per cent of all carbon monoxide deaths and injuries occur in the home. Thanks to our Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, private member's bill passed on December 12, 2013, the Hawkins-Gignac Act, carbon monoxide alarms are since mandatory in all Ontario homes. This law has helped ensure that Ontario families are protected in their homes and has resulted in the creation of Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Can the minister please tell us why Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week is so important in Ontario? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and affairs. I thank the member from uh, Glengarry Prescott Russell for uh, her important question about the week, the most important week in Ontario. I'm proud to have introduced and seen the Hawkins-Ginnick Act passed as my private member's bill in 2013. <laughs> A constituent in my riding, Gloria Hawkins, had faced tragic consequences within her family in 2008 when a blocked chimney vent had forced carbon monoxide from the gas fireplace back into her home, ending in a fatality. My bill required carbon monoxide alarms to be in all homes across Ontario. These alarms help notify you at the early stages of poisonous gas in your home and are the best preventative measure to save lives. As we look forward to observing the fourth annual Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week in Ontario, I would like to thank all of the fire departments, Spons. along with all our first responders across Ontario, that help ensure Ontarians are safe each and every day. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for his answer and for his hard work on his private member's bill that now helps save lives across Ontario. Unfortunately, many Canadians do not replace the batteries of their carbon monoxide detectors, thinking that they last much longer than they do. Unfortunately, there are still many Canadians who do not replace the batteries on their carbon monoxide alarms, believing that they last much longer than they actually do. And still, many do not have their heating systems checked annually. And there are also still many who believe you only need a carbon monoxide alarm if you have a gas furnace. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Can the minister please tell us what this government is doing to promote best practices and raise awareness on the dangers of carbon monoxide in household appliances and in family homes? Minister. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Ministry of Community Safety and Corrections. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Sir, and uh, thank you to the member of Glengarry Prescott Russell for that very important question. I'd also like to thank the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs for being a leader on this very important issue. My ministry is committed to ensuring that all Ontarians are safe across the province and especially in their own homes. Since 2013, all homes across the province, including apartment buildings and condos, are required to have carbon monoxide detectors in their units. My ministry recommends that Ontario residents have all their fuel-burning appliances and vents inspected annually and that all installed carbon monoxide alarms are tested regularly. Our ministry provides online resources and assistance in our communities to educate Ontarians on best practices to keep their families safe every day and especially during this important week. I'd like to thank John Jinak and his family for raising Response. awareness on this important issue that has tragically impacted his family, and to all our firefighter departments and first responders across the province for keeping Ontarians safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Labour. Adam Brunt died tragically three and a half years ago while training to become a firefighter. Five years earlier, Gary Kendall also died in a safety training exercise. Both men died while taking an unregulated, unsafe private training course with the private company Herschel Rescue. When it comes to these private training companies, there are no rules or regulations, but there can be tragic consequences. But the minister knows that. One year ago, as the PC critic for community safety, she wrote a letter of support for the adoption of the jury recommendations from the inquest into the deaths of Gary Kendall and Adam Brunt. She wrote, 
Quote, it is clear that establishing clear training standards and regulations, along with proper mechanisms of oversight and regulation, would prevent further deaths and or injuries. End quote. Does the Minister of Labour still believe in standards, regulation and oversight of private training companies to keep our future firefighters safe? Minister of Labour. To the Minister of Community and Correctional Services, please. Minister of Community, sorry, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've always mentioned, public safety is a primary concern of our ministry. As such, we remain committed to improving and enhancing public safety. Over the last few months, including at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario's annual conference, we heard very clearly from municipalities and stakeholders that the certification regulation would present significant challenges for fire services and municipalities, in particular small, rural and northern municipalities with volunteer fire departments. We intend to and work with municipalities and with the fire departments to ensure that adequate training is presented, but it will, be based on, it will be based on a timely uh, uh, a timely, uh, on, with, a, with taking into account the finances and. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, and with all due respect for that answer, that answer is completely irrelevant. The question is about unprotected private safety trainees, not about firefighters, not about certification. That is completely a separate issue. So back to the Minister of Labour. Since the tragic and preventable death of 30-year-old Adam Brunt, I have called on the government for three and a half years to regulate this rogue industry. We regulate and, li we regulate and license driving instructors, but not private instructors of safety and rescue courses. Adam was not yet a firefighter, did not die in a workplace or while taking a college course, so he wasn't protected by the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services or by the Ministry of Labour or by the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, but he did deserve to be protected. Last year, my motion to adopt the inquest jury recommendations was unanimously adopted by all parties. Now I'm asking this government to support my bill, the Brunt and Kendall Act, to regulate, license and oversee private safety and rescue training courses in Ontario. As the Minister of Labour once said, we should, quote, protect our brave first responders from unnecessary risk of loss of life, end quote. Will the minister and this government support my bill to protect future firefighters and firefighter trainees in going forward in their careers to keep us safe? Good question. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, respectfully, I disagree with the premise of the question. In effect, in effect, public safety is something that concerns the province, and we are looking at the entire, the entire issue relating to fire regulations, and we will deal with the issues. Order. Next question, the member for Durham. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Build Force Labour Market Forecast says that 250,000 construction workers, or 21 per cent of Canada's construction workforce, will retire this decade. Meanwhile, youth unemployment is consistently double the unemployment rate for the rest of the population. I know from speaking with our job creators in Durham that many businesses find the current regulation of skilled trades, specifically the Ontario College of Trades, to be ineffective. The college's overly burdensome red tape drags down Ontario's economy and negatively impacts businesses' ability to grow and create good jobs. The government recently introduced a bill which, if passed, will wind down the Ontario College of Trades. Can the minister tell us how the bill would help address the skills gap, create good jobs for our young people, and make Ontario open for business? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question and the work they do every day for the people of Durham. Our legislation, if passed, will wind down the Ontario College of Trades, and we've heard from employers that the current system is not delivering for Ontario's workers, employers, or its economy. Patrick McManus from the Ontario Skilled Trades Alliance has said, quote, 
I am very encouraged by the proposed changes, with a particular interest in the Ontario College of Trades, which created a mountain of red tape and added an administrative burden, burden to employers. The Making Ontario Open for Business Act will bring us into modern times and reduce barriers to enter the skilled trades. Speaker, we promise the people of Ontario to create good jobs in Ontario, fill the skills gap, and make Ontario Response. open for business. Thank you. That, that concludes the time for question period. A number of members have informed me they have points of order they would like to raise. First one is Mississauga, Erin Mills. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would like to welcome the students from Loyola Catholic Secondary School uh, from my riding, great 10 and their teachers who are coming to visit the uh, Legislative Assembly today. Welcome in Queensburg. The member for Hamilton West, Anne Castor Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to say the name of my great uncle in this house. Uh, he was killed 100 years ago this week in action, and um, it was just a few short days before uh, Armistice Day. He was only 18 years of age, and his name was Adam Shaw. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Windsor to come see. Speaker, Toronto's Now magazine has just published its best list, and I'd like to congratulate the member for Toronto Danforth, Peter Tabins, for being named Now's magazine best member of provincial parliament. Oh. Congratulations to the member for Toronto Danforth. Next, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to ask all members of the legislature to join us on the Grand Staircase for a picture to uh, commemorate or to recognize Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week. Next, we have the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to take a moment and welcome my friend, Mr. Girish Davan, to the House this, this morning in the uh, Members' Gallery. Next, we have Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, I would like to add the name of the Canadian soldiers who paid the ultimate price during their peacekeeping mission in Cyprus to the list of the Canadian soldiers who perished uh, serving our country. Thank you. Is that it for points of order? Okay. I'm going to clarify. The Speaker can't read your mind. If, uh, if you want to do a point of order, it would be helpful if you would stand in your place and shout out point of order so audibly so the speaker can hear you. Are there any other members who would like to do a point of order? Member for Mississauga Centre. Speaker, uh, yesterday we celebrated Halloween, and, but today we are celebrating All Saints Day. And in the Catholic tradition, in the Christian tradition, today we offer our prayers and we visit the graves of our uh, beloved deceased. So I just wanted to remind all members that today is All Saints Day. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning climate change. This matter will be debated Tuesday, November 13, 2018, at 6 p.m. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>